from San Mateo. It's The Cube, covering Scalar Innovation Day. Brought to you by Scalar. Hey everyone, I'm John Furrier with The Cube. We are here for an innovation day at Scalar's headquarters in San Mateo, California. Uh, profiling the hot startups, technology leaders, and also value properties. Our next guest is Casey Clark, who's the Chief Customer Officer for Scalar. Great to see you. Great thanks to see for, you as well. Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming in. So what is it, uh, talk about the customer value proposition. Let's get right to it. Who are your customers? Yeah. Who are you guys targeting? Yeah. Give some examples of what they're, what's, what they're doing with you yeah. guys. We sell primarily to engineering driven companies. Um, so, you know, the top dog is the, the CTO. Um, you know, they're probably born in the cloud or moving heavily towards the cloud. They're using, um, you know, things like microservices, Kubernetes, maybe starting to look at, at serverless. So, really kind of forward thinking, engineering driven businesses are, are where we uh, start with, you know, some of the companies that. We work with, uh, you know, career builder, scripts networks, discovery networks, um, a lot of kind of modern e-commerce, uh, media, uh, B2B, B2C types of, of SaaS businesses as well. I want to get, I want to drill down on that a little bit later, but you know, basically born in the cloud, yep. seems to be that's a big cloud native. Yep, absolutely. All right, so you guys are a startup, Series A funded, um, which is, you know, in Silicon Valley terms, you guys are right out, of, right out of the gate. Yep. Talk about the status of the product, um, yeah. evolution of the value proposition stages. You guys are in market, selling to customers yeah. actively. Yeah. What's the status of the product? And yeah. where, where is it from a customer standpoint? Sure, yeah, we've got you know, over 300 customers, and so fairly mature in terms of uh, you know, product and market uh, status. Uh, we were very fortunate to land some very large customers that pushed us when we were you know, seven, so on uh, employees maybe three or four years ago, and so that, that forced us to mature very quickly. Large enterprises that had, you know, we have this one customer, Zalando, in Germany, they're one of the largest e-commerce e businesses in, in Europe, and they have two, 3,000 engineers using the product on a weekly basis, and we landed them when it was seven employees uh, you know, three or four years ago, and so that forced us to mature and so it was very easy for us to go to other enterprises and say yeah we can work with you and here's the proof points on how we've helped this business uh, mature how they've improved kind of their their speed to truth their time to answer whenever they have issues and so the so the just to kind of back up the playbook was early on when they had seven folks and growing beta status was that kind of commercially available when did it when was the tipping point uh, for commercially available when did that yeah. click in? That, that probably tipped when I joined uh, about a little under four years ago um, I had to convince Steve that he was ready to sell this product, <laughs> right, as you would expect with a kind of technical founder. He never thought the product was ready to go, but they already had maybe a dozen or so kind of friends and family customers. Um, and so I kind of came in and, and went to my network and started trying to figure out who were the right fits for this. Yeah. Um, and we immediately found, uh, you know, traction. The product just stood up and we started pushing it, so. And you guys are attracting some good talent. You know, some Silicon Valley tech uh, leaders are joining you guys, yeah. uh, which is a great sign when you got talent coming in. Yeah. On the customer side, um, a lot's changed in four years. Years, yeah. um, obviously, the edge of the network. I mean, digital transformation has been a punchline, yeah. been kind of a cliche, but now I think it's more real. Yeah. As people see the power of scale to cloud, right. on premise, you're seeing hybrid, multi cloud is being validated. What is the current customer uh, profile when you look at pure cloud yeah. versus on premise? Are you guys seeing different traction points? Can you share a little bit of color on that? Yeah. So I talked a little bit about our, our ideal customer profile being, you know, of these kind of four categories, e-commerce, media, B2B SaaS, B2C SaaS. Um, you know, most of these companies are running some production workloads in the cloud and probably the majority are in the cloud. Uh, when we started this thing, you know, it was only AWS and GCP and Azure were, were never talked about. We're seeing significant traction with Azure and then specific regions, Southeast Asia, uh, GCP is, is, is very hot. So we're seeing a, a high demand uh, there. And then with the pro proliferation of microservices, Kubernetes has absolutely taken off. I mean, I'll raise my hand and say, I wasn't sure if it was going to be Kubernetes and Mesos two years ago. I was said, oh, I think Mesos is going to be the one to, to bet the company on. Um, thank God we didn't do that. Uh, and we went with Kubernetes. Um, and uh, you know, so we're seeing a lot more of, of kind of these distributed workloads, distributed team development. Yeah, and that's got a lot of headroom now. The, uh, you know, KubeCon was just uh, last week, so it was interesting, kind of the yep. growth of that whole. You got service meshes right around the corner. Yeah. Microservices going to yeah, service gonna throw off there. more data. Yeah, for sure. It's been, <laughs> and that's one of the big problems that we run in with logs is that people just say they're too voluminous. It's either too hard to search through it, it's too expensive. We don't know what to deal with it, and so they're trying to find other ways to kind of get observability. And so you see uh, kind of the growth of some of the metrics companies like uh, Datadog Infrastructure Monitoring, Phenomenal Infrastructure Monitoring Company. Um, you've got lots of tracing companies come out, and, and really, Really, they're coming out because 
there's just so many logs, it's either too expensive, too hard, too slow to search through all that data. That's where your answers live. Um, and they're just extracting, summarizing value to, to try to kind of minimize the amount of search that you have to do. Talk about the competition, I mean, because you mentioned a few of them, Splunk's out there as well, yeah. and they were went public a couple of years ago. Um, and there's different price points, I get that, but what's why can't they scale to the level that you guys have? Because, yeah. and how do you compare to them? Because I mean, I know data's getting larger, but what's different about you guys vis-a-vis -vis the competition? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I joined the company. What excites me the most is, is I get to go talk to engineers and I can just talk shop. I don't really talk about the business value quite as much. We get there at some point, obviously. Um, but we made some, some very key decisions early on in the company's history. I mean, really before the company started. Um, two kind of main back-end architectural decisions. One, we don't use Elasticsearch, Lucene, any sort of keyword indexing, which is what you know almost every single logging tool uses on, on the back end. Keyword indexes, Elasticsearch are great for human legible words, uh, relatively stale lists, um, where you're not looking through you know infinite numbers of high cardinality kind of machine data. Um, so we made an optimized decision uh, to, to use a NoSQL uh, database, this proprietary columnar database. So that's one aspect of things, how we process and, and store the data is, is highly efficient. The other piece is, is we're a SaaS business, but we're true SaaS, we're true multi-tenant. And so when you put a query into to Scalar, every CPU core and every server is executing on just that query. It's very similar to the way Google Search works. Uh, so not only do we get better performance, but we get better costs and better scalability across you know, all of our customers. And you guys do sell to an engineering-led buyer, and you, you yeah. mentioned that. Um, a lot of SaaS companies that are, a lot of companies that are trying to come in and sell that market, bump into people who want to build their own. Yeah. Like, I don't need your help, because yeah, I, yeah. I, might, I might get fired, or yeah. might make me look good. That seems to be a go-to-market dynamic, or, yeah. and or consumption piece. What's your response to that? How does that, yeah. how's that fared for you guys? Engineers want to engineer, whether it's the, the right thing or not, right? And so that, that is always hard, and I can't come in and tell you your baby's ugly, right? Because your baby is beautiful in your eyes. And so that is a hard conversation to have, but that's why I kind of go back to what I was saying is we just talk shop. We talk about, you know, the, 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 the engineering decisions around, you know, is that the right database? Is this the right architecture? And, they, you know, they start nodding and nodding and nodding. And then we say, and the values are going to be X, Y, and Z, cost, performance, scalability. Um, and so when you kind of get them to understand that, like, well, Elasticsearch is great for a lot of things, product search, web uh, search search, phenomenal. But log management, high cardinality machine data, it's not what it's designed for. And okay, okay, okay. And then we start to get them to come around and say, not only can you reallocate, I mean, we talked about how getting talent is, is hard. Well, let's put them back on, you know, mission critical business, you know, engineering objectives. Uh, and we get, you know, a service that this is all we do. Like you can have a couple people in their part-time managing a logging service. This is all we do. And so you get things like, like tracing that we're rolling out this quarter, you know, better cost optimization, better scalability, things that you would never get with an open source. So the, the initial reaction might be, to go in and sell on, hey, it's cheaper solution and yeah. there's an economic buyer. Not really for these kinds of products because you're dealing with engineers. Yeah, they yeah. want to talk shop first. That seems to be the playbook. Yeah, our, our artist is getting that first meeting. Getting the first meeting is hard because they, you know they're busy. They're, everybody's busy. They just wave you off. They ignore the email, the calls, and, and and we get that. But once we get in, we have kind of this consultative you know conversation around why why we made these technology decisions. They get it. Oh, so let's do a first meeting right now. Yeah, people watching this video. Yeah. What's the architectural advantages? Let's talk shop. Yeah, yeah. Why you guys? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of two technical differentiators and then three sort of benefits that come from those two technical choices. One is, is what I mentioned, this proprietary uh, you know, columnar NoSQL database specifically designed for kind of high cardinality machine data, right? There is no indexes that need to be backed up or tuned. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a massively paralleled uh, grep to, to its simplest form. So one piece is that database. The other piece is that architecture where we get, you know, one performance benefits of throwing every CP core and every server on just your query. Very similar to the way Google search works. If I go say, how do I make a pizza in Google? It's not like it goes to like a KC server in a data center in Alaska and runs for a bit. They're throwing a ton of compute power at every query. So there's the performance piece. There's the scalability piece. We have one huge, massive pool of shared compute resources. And so your log volume can spike, but relative to the capacity we have, it means nothing, right? But all these other services that are single tenant, uh, you know, hosted services, you know, th there's a capacity limit and you, a single customer, if your log volume, you know, doubles, well, it wasn't designed to, to handle that, that uh, log volume doubling. Um, and then, you know, the last piece is the cost. There's a huge economies of scale, shared services. We, we run the system at a significantly lower cost uh, than what anybody else can. And so you get, you know, cost benefits, performance benefits, and scalability benefits. In the life of the engineer, your buyer here, um, what are some of the day in the life use case uh, pain in the butts yeah. that they have. I mean, it's a challenge. It's, it's yeah. always, DevOps is basically, usually the, the, the people who do DevOps are pretty hardcore and they, yeah. love, they love it and they tend to love the engineering side of it. But what are the hassles for them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you solve. So, you know, 
kind of going back to what we're all about, we're all about speed to truth, right? In, in kind of a modern environment where you're deploying every day, multiple times per day, uh, a lot of times there's no QA, you're de deploying directly to produ production, right? And your kind of butt is on the line when that code goes live. You need to be able to kind of get speed to truth as quickly as possible, right? You need to be able to um, identify when a problem went wrong uh, or when something went wrong immediately, and then you need to be able to come up with a resolution, right? There's always two things that we always talk about, mean time to restore and mean time to resolution, right? There is, you know, maybe the SREs uh, are responsible for mean time to restore. So they're in scalar, they get an alert, they're immediately diving through the logs to figure out, okay, it's this service, either we need to restart it, or how do we kind of just put a Band-Aid on top of it to make sure our customers don't see it, right? And then it gets kicked over to the developer who wrote the code and say, okay, now mean time to resolution. How, how long until we figure out what went wrong and how do we fix it to make sure it doesn't happen again? And that's where we help. You know, it's interesting, Casey, you mentioned the resolution piece. A lot of engineers uh, that become operationalized through your service, not operations people just being called DevOps, is that they have to actually do this as an SLA basis when they do a lot of API to API. It only gets more complicated yeah. with service meshes, yeah. right? Yeah. Or oh, these microservices frameworks, because yep. now you have services being stood up and torn down literally without human intervention. Yeah. Yep. So this notion of having a path of validation, yeah. working with other services, yep. is, a, is, is a could be a pain in the but big yeah. time. Yeah, I mean, it's very difficult. We've, you know, with some of the large organizations we work with, work with, they've tried to build their own service meshes and they've, you know, got into a massive conference room and tried to write out all the different services that are out there. And the reality is they can't figure out, there's no good way for them to map out, like who talks to what, when, and, you know, each little service knows like, okay, well, here's the downstream effects and they kind of know what's next to them. They know their adjacencies, but they don't really know much further than that. Um, and the nice thing about, you know, logs and all kind of the, the voluminous data that is in there, which makes it very difficult to manage, but the answers are, are in there, right? And so we provide a lot of value by giving you one place to look through all of that At data. KubeCon, this has been a big topic because a lot of times just to be more hardcore is that there could be downtime on the services they don't even know about it. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly so right. So discovering and visualizing that or surfacing is huge. Yep. Okay, what's the one thing that people should know about Scalar that haven't um, uh, talked to you guys or know about you guys, should know about you guys and consider? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the reality is everybody's trying to move as quickly as possible, and, and there is a better way. You know, uh, observability, telemetry, monitoring, whatever you call your team, um, is core to the business, right? It's core to to moving faster. It's core to providing a better user experience. Um, and, and we have, you know, spent a, a significant amount of time building unique technology to support your business's growth. Um, and I think, you know, you can look at the benefits. I've talked about them: cost, performance, scalability, right? But these align well with whatever you're looking at. If it's if it's PNL, if it's you know service uptime, uh, that's exactly what we provide is, is a tool to help you give a better experience to your end customers. Casey, thanks for spending the time and sharing that insight. Of course, we love Speed to Truth. It's our motto at the Cube. We go to the events and try to get the data out there. We're here at the Innovation Day at Scalers Headquarters. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching.